not an accident that the, the struggle of the black man in this country for the past 10 or 15 years has been called a struggle for civil rights. Because as long as you're struggling for civil rights, what you're doing is asking these racist segregationists who control Washington, D.C., and they control Washington, D.C. They control the federal government through these committees. And as long as this thing is a civil rights struggle, you're asking uh, it at a level where your uh, so-called benefactor is actually someone from the worst part of this country. And you can, you can only go forward to the degree that they let you. But when you, uh, late, when, you, when you get involved in a struggle for human rights, it's completely out of the jurisdiction of the United States government. You take it to the United Nations. And then when you any problem that is taken to the, United, to the United Nations, the United States has no say-so on it whatsoever because in the UN, she only has one vote. And in the UN, the, the, the uh, largest block of votes is the African uh, continent of Africa has the largest block of votes than any continent on this earth. And the continent of Africa coupled with the Asian block and the Arab block comprises the uh, over two-thirds of the UN forces, and they're the Dox nations. That's the only court that you can go to today and get your own people, the people who look like you, on your side, is in the United Nations. And this could have been done 15 years ago. It could have been done 19 years ago. But they tricked us. They got a hold of our leaders and used our leaders to lead us right back to their courts, knowing that they control their courts. And so the leaders look like they're leading us against an enemy, but when you analyze the struggle that we've been involved in for the past 15 years, the good or the progress that we've made is actually disgraceful, and we should be ashamed to even use the word progress uh, in the context of our struggle. So, uh, there has been a move on, and I, I will conclude in a moment, there has been a move on to keep the Negro thinking in this country that he was making strides in the civil rights field only for the purpose of distracting him and not letting him know that were he to acquaint himself with the structure of the United Nations and the politics of the United Nations, the aim and the purpose of the United Nations, he could lift his problem into that uh, world body and he'd have the strongest stick in the world that he could use against the racists in Mississippi. But it was known that it was, uh, and one of the arguments against getting you and me to do this has always been that our problem is a domestic problem of the United States. And as such, uh, we should not uh, think to put it at a level where somebody else can come and mess with the United States domestic affairs. But you're giving Uncle Sam a break. Uncle Sam got his hands in the Congo, in Cuba, in, in, in South America. In Saigon, Uncle Sam has got his bloody hands in every continent and in everybody else's business on this earth. But at the same time, when it comes to taking forceful action in this country, where our rights are concerned, he's always going to tell you and me, well, these are state rights. Or he'll make some kind of off-the-wall uh, alibi that's not a, not a bona fide alibi, not because it's an alibi, but to justify his inactivity where you and my rights are concerned. So the, we were successful, have been successful, in uh, first when we realized that we had to bring this to the United Nations, we knew that we had to get support, we had to get world support, and that the most logical part of the world to look for support is among people who look just like you and me. And uh, so I was uh, fortunate to be able to make a tour of the African continent during the summer. I uh, went to first in the Middle East and Africa. I went to uh, first to Egypt, then to Arabia, Kuwait, uh, Lebanon, and then to Sudan, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanganyika, uh, Zanzibar, Nigeria, uh, Ghana, Guinea, Liberia, and Algeria. Algeria. And then I, and I found, while I was traveling on the African continent, I had already detected it in May, that there, someone had very shrewdly planted the seed of division uh, on this continent to make the Africans not show genuine concern with our problem, just as they plant seeds in your and my mind so that we won't show concern with the African problem. 
They're trying to make you and me think that the, we're separate and the two problems are separate. So then, when I went back this time and traveled to those different countries, I was fortunate enough to uh, spend an hour and a half with NASA in Egypt, which is the a North African country, and three hours with President Nyeri in uh, Tanganyika, which has now become Tanzania, which is an East African country, and with Prime Minister Obote, Northern Obote in Uganda, which is also an East African country, and with uh, Jomo Kenyatta in Kenya, which is another East African country, and with President Azikwe in Nigeria, uh, President Nkrumah in Ghana, and President Kukure in Guinea. And I found that in every one of these African countries, the head of state is, is genuinely concerned with the problem of the black man in this country, but many of them thought that if they opened their mouth and uh, voiced concern, that they would be insulted by the American Negro leaders. Because uh, one head of state in Asia voiced his support of the civil rights struggle, and one of the big, couple of the big six had the audacity to Sabbath face and say they weren't interested in that kind of help, which in my opinion is, is asinine. And so that the African leaders only had to be convinced that if they took an open stand at the governmental level and, and, and showed interest in the problem of black people in this country, that they wouldn't be rebuffed. And today, you'll find in the United Nations, and it's not an accident, that every time the uh, Congo question or anything on the African continent is, is being debated in the Security Council, they couple it with what's going on or what's happening to you and me in Mississippi and Alabama and these other places. And in my opinion, the greatest accomplishment that was made for the, in the uh, struggle of the black man in America in 1964 uh, towards some kind of real progress was the successful link, linking together of our problem with the African problem or making our problem a world problem. Because now, whenever anything happens to you in Mississippi, it's not a case of just somebody in, a, in, in Alabama getting indignant or somebody in New York getting indignant. Whatever happens in Mississippi today, with the attention of the African nations drawn towards Mississippi at a, at a governmental level, then the same repercussions that you see all over the world when, uh, when, 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 uh, when an imperialist or foreign power interferes in some section of Africa, you see repercussions. You see the, the embassies being bombed and burned and overturned. Nowadays, when something happens to black people in Mississippi, you will see the same repercussions all over the world. And I wanted to point this out to you because it is important for you to know that when you're in Mississippi, you're not alone. But as long as you think you're alone, then you take a stand as if you're a minority or as if you're outnumbered, and that kind of stand will, will never enable you to win a battle. You've got to know that you've got as much power on your side as that Ku Klux Klan has on its side. And when you know that you've got just as much power on your side as the Klan has on its side, you'll talk the same kind of language with that Klan that that Klan is talking with you. And when I, I, and I say one more thing and then I conclude. When I say the same kind of language, I should explain what I mean. See, you can never have good relations with anybody that you can't communicate with. You can never have good relations with anybody that doesn't understand you. There has to be an understanding. Understanding is brought about through dialogue. Dialogue is communication of ideas. This can only be done in a language, a common language. And you can never talk French to somebody who speaks only German and think you're communicating. Neither, they don't get the point. And you have to be able to speak a man's language in order to make him get the point. Now, you've lived in Mississippi long enough to know what the language of the Ku Klux Klan is. They only know one language. And now, you can come up with another language. They don't, you don't communicate. You've got to be able to speak the same language they speak, whether you were in Mississippi, New York City, or Alabama, or California, or anywhere else. And when you develop or mature to the point where you can speak another man's language on his level, that man gets the point. That's the only time he gets the point. You can't talk peace to a person who doesn't know what peace means. You can't talk love to a person who doesn't know what love means. And you can't talk any form of nonviolence to a person who doesn't believe in nonviolence while you're wasting your time. So I think in 1965, whether you like it or I like it or we like it or they like it or not, you will see that there is a generation of black people born in this country who become mature to the point where they feel 
that they have no more business being asked to take a peaceful approach than anybody else takes unless everybody's going to take a peaceful, peaceful approach. So we, here in the Organization of Afro-American Unity, we're with the struggle in Mississippi 1,000%. We're with the efforts to register our people in Mississippi to vote 1,000%. But we do not go along with anybody telling us to help nonviolence. We think if somebody is going to try, if the government says that Negroes have a right to vote, and then when Negroes go out to vote, some kind of Ku Klux Klan is going to put them in the river, and the government doesn't do anything about it, it's time for us to organize and band together and equip ourselves and qualify ourselves to protect ourselves. And once you can protect yourself, you don't have to worry about being hurt.